A left-wing assassin plans to murder Justice Kavanaugh, and the media remains strangely silent. Joe Biden's approval ratings hit historic lows, even as Jimmy Kimmel provides him psychosexual gratification on national TV, and Democrats try to manipulate Americans on gun control. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. Today's show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Do you like your web history being seen and sold to advertisers? No? Me neither. Get ExpressVPN right now at expressvpn.com slash Ben. We'll get to all the news in just one moment. First, as you know, you're paying way too much money for all of the things. Thanks to Joe Biden, the best president in the history of the entire earth, according to our wonderful media. But here is the thing. You can lower your bills on some products. One of those products, your cell phone bill. You're spending way too much for the coverage from the big guys. At Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, they are charging you a premium fee every single month for data you don't use. Why are you paying for things you don't use? That's a silly thing to do. Instead of paying 89 bucks a month to your current provider, pay just 20 bucks to Pure Talk for what you actually need. I made the switch. I will be honest, I was nervous a little bit at first thinking, well, is my coverage going to decline? My, my ability to actually hear phone calls? The answer is no, because they use the same tower system as one of the big guys. And here is the thing. You're not going to lose anything there, and you are going to lose money off your bill. So if you've been sitting on the fence because, I don't know, you've been thinking maybe the big guys have better coverage, then that is wrong. Instead, head on over to puretalk.com, select a plan, enter promo code Shapiro, save 50% off your very first month. You can literally be switched over to Pure Talk service in less than 10 minutes. Head on over to puretalk.com, enter promo code Shapiro to get started again. That is puretalk.com. Use promo code Shapiro to get started today. Well, if this had happened to a Democratic justice, a Democratic appointed justice, and it had been a Republican gunman who was loitering outside that justice's house with a gun in his backpack and zip ties and a knife and pepper spray and full preparations to kill that justice and his or her family, you can imagine that it would not just be the top news of every major news network. It would be the top news for weeks on end because it would all be chalked up to the evils of Republican rhetoric and the fiery oratory of people on Fox News. It'd be chalked up to shows like this one. It'd be chalked up to every Republican politician. Every single Republican politician in America would be asked about the increase in the temperature of the rhetoric that had led to this awful point in American life. We know that's true because after January 6th, the idea is that every Republican everywhere is answerable for a couple of hundred idiots going into the Capitol building and doing violence to police officers and then promptly being arrested. The idea is that we are all collectively guilty when somebody does a thing. When a white supremacist shooter murders a bunch of black people in Buffalo, New York, the entire Republican infrastructure is responsible. Fox News and Tucker Carlson are responsible. Candace Owens and I are somehow responsible for all of this sort of stuff. That is the rhetoric of the left. Whenever a bad thing happens, and that bad thing is even remotely connectable, even if it is not logically supportable, if you can connect it at the most tenuous level to some sort of broader right-wing thought, then we have to have a conversation about conservatism in this country. We have to have a conversation about the evils of the right in this country. Well, yesterday, a man was arrested outside the house of Justice Brett Kavanaugh. He was arrested because he was fully intending to kill Justice Brett Kavanaugh, and he was armed and ready to do so. The only reason that he did not carry out his plan is because there was armed security outside Justice Brett Kavanaugh's house. Yet another reminder that armed security is a good thing wherever you have vulnerable people. I know some people have trouble with that when it comes to, for example, schools, but the simple fact is that if there had not been armed security at Brett Kavanaugh's house, then this person probably would have killed somebody. According to the New York Times, a man armed with a pistol, a knife, and other weapons was arrested near the Maryland home of Justice Brett Kavanaugh early Wednesday after he said he traveled from California to kill the Supreme Court justice, according to federal officials. This particular offender, and again, I don't mention the names of people who are seeking attention like this on this show, unlike most other legacy media outlets, which spend inordinate time blowing up the name, picture, and profile of political terrorists in order to presumably create copycats, or at least without regard as to whether they create copycats. We don't mention the names of people like this on this particular show. He was charged with attempted murder after two U.S. deputy marshals saw him step out of a taxi cab in front of the justice's house in Chevy Chase, Maryland, early on Wednesday morning, according to federal prosecutors. This particular attempted murderer was dressed in black, carrying a suitcase and a backpack, according to a federal affidavit. Inside the suitcase and backpack, the authorities discovered a black tactical chest rig and tactical knife, a pistol with two magazines and ammo, pepper spray, zip ties, a hammer, a screwdriver, a nail punch, a crowbar, a pistol light and duct tape, in addition to other items, according to the affidavit. According to the affidavit, his plan was to break into the house, kill the justice, and then kill himself. And his motives are perfectly clear. His motives are perfectly clear because he told the police his motives. He said he was upset about the recent school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, which, by the way, that that is definitely the proper solution. You're upset about a mass school shooting. So your plan is to kill a justice and maybe members of his family if they stumble upon you. 
He was also upset about a leaked draft of a Supreme Court opinion suggesting the justices were poised to overturn Roe versus Wade, the landmark 1973 pro-abortion decision by the Supreme Court. Now, we said at the time that leaking prospective Supreme Court draft decisions is extremely dangerous. I said this at the time. I said the day this happened, it put justices' lives in danger because before that decision is actually released, that means that the vote is not actually official. And so if you are a crazy person and you wish to shape the course of future American history, maybe you try to kill one of the justices. I said it was actually a sin for Justice Roberts not to, upon the leak, immediately release the decision as the majority decision because it would create incentive for evil and or crazy people to go and try to kill a justice in the majority in order to change the course of judicial history. I said it at the time. And there were protests immediately upon the leak at Justice Kavanaugh's house, you'll recall, and the home of the other justices. Apparently, according to this particular suspect, he indicated he believed that the justice he intended to kill would side with Second Amendment decisions that would loosen gun control laws. So this guy is from California, which has extraordinarily strict gun controls, transported a gun across state lines to Justice Kavanaugh's house, and then proceeded to attempt to kill the justice in order to promote gun control, which means this will be out of the headlines before it even begins. In fact, it was pretty much out of the headlines immediately. Well, if all of this makes you feel a little bit unsafe at home and, hey, you don't have armed security standing outside your home because you're not a Supreme Court justice, maybe you should get a service that actually provides you more safety for your home. This is one reason you might need Ring Alarm. So Ring is the video doorbell company, right? But they don't just do that. They also make an award-winning home security system with available professional monitoring when you subscribe. Best of all, you can easily install Ring Alarm yourself. Ring didn't stop there. They changed the home security game entirely with Ring Alarm Pro. That's why I've decided to team up with Ring. When it comes to protecting my own home, I've gone pro with Ring Alarm Pro. Again, I'm a public figure. That means I care a lot about my security. So if I'm using Ring Alarm Pro, that means you probably should as well. Ring Alarm Pro is a next level security system. CNET calls Ring Alarm Pro a giant leap for home security after using it. I can say that they are right because they combined a home security system and a Wi-Fi router. This thing helps protect your home and secure your network. With a Ring Protect Pro subscription, it's an amazing deal. I get professional monitoring for the ultimate peace of mind. If anything happens, professional monitoring will call me and can request emergency services. You might not have known it, but it is true. Ring has an award-winning alarm. So this busy summer season, to protect my home, I've gone pro with Ring Alarm Pro, and you should do the same. To learn more, go to ring.com forward slash Ben. That is ring.com forward slash Ben. Once more, ring.com forward slash Ben to get started protecting your home the way it should be protected. Again, this was not played as the top story by the mainstream media last night. It was not. There were other stories to cover, like the House passing a doomed gun control bill or the appearance of Joe Biden on Jimmy Kimmel. These were major stories. But the attempted murder of a Supreme Court justice by a left-wing radical spouting ideologically, ideologically indistinguishable ideas from those of mainstream leftists, that Brett Kavanaugh is responsible for the end of abortion in the country, that Brett Kavanaugh is a gun nut, all the rest of this, that that was just not a headline. In fact, the New York Times online front page as of yesterday afternoon did not have this story on it. There were 16 stories on their front page, and this was not on it. So the New York Times reported it. They just kind of buried it. In fact, if you look the, the very next morning at this story, this story is, is not above the fold on the page. It is really not below the fold on the page. Okay, the, This story appears in a tiny little area of the... Uh, I'm going to count the number of stories real fast that are above this story on the New York Times online website front page. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38. There are 38 stories above this story. Counting that in real time. As of this as, as of this show, there are 38 stories, 38 above this story on the New York Times homepage. You want to know why? The answer is because this person is a left winger who's attempting to murder a Supreme Court justice. If this person been a right winger attempting to murder a Supreme Court justice, we have weeks of conversation in the legacy media about the evils of America and white supremacy and conservatism and all the rest of the things that the media like to lump together as the Republican Party agenda. Officers from Montgomery County Police Department arrived and found the shooter on the phone with the communication center. Apparently, he called the cops and got himself arrested after he realized that he was not going to succeed in his attempt to kill Kavanaugh. He was taken into custody without incident. If convicted, he could face up to 20 years in prison. 
He told police he had begun thinking about how to give his life a purpose and decided to kill a Supreme Court justice after finding the justice's address online. Why? Who could have been revealing the justice's address online? Who would have been doing that? Oh, you mean the activist groups who said that you should gather outside Justice Kavanaugh's house? Prompted, motivated, and cheered by members of the Democratic Party and some members of the media? Lest you think that this is an exaggeration, let me remind you that this is precisely what many on the Democratic side said. Hey, Jen Psaki, for example, was asked just a couple of weeks ago about protesters outside justices' homes, and she could not bring it, she could not find it in her heart to condemn it. There are voices on the right who have called out um, this uh, protests that are happening uh, while remaining <coughs> silent for years on protests that have happened outside of the homes of school board members, the Michigan Secretary of State, or including threats made to women seeking reprodu reproductive health care or even an insurrection against our capital. So I know that there's an outrage right now, I guess, about uh, protests that have been peaceful to date, and we certainly continue to encourage that outside of judges' homes, and that's the president's position. But the silence is pretty deafening about all of the other intimidation that we've seen to a number of people. I've said every single time people protest outside of somebody's house, I've said that that is wrong because that is somebody's house. Okay, but put that aside. That was the White House press secretary, Jen Psaki, before she just moved right on over to the propaganda wing of the White House, MSNBC. There she was, literally saying that the president encourages protest at the homes of justices, which, by the way, does, in fact, violate local law. You are not allowed to go to people's houses where Justice Kavanaugh lives and then try to intimidate justices into changing their positions. And there, there's a case that's obstruction of justice on a federal level, that if you try to change a justice's decision through threats or intimidation, that you got a problem. A again, that was Jen Psaki, the White House press secretary, who couldn't bring herself to condemn people protesting outside the homes of justices. I mean, a, a year ago, in well, in 2020, in the, in the middle of a pro-abortion rally, Chuck Schumer, the current Senate Majority Leader, he actually threatened Brett Kavanaugh with, with consequences. Those consequences were unclear. I'm not suggesting that, that Chuck Schumer thinks that Justice Brett Kavanaugh should be murdered. What I'm saying is that his rhetoric here is about as vague as Donald Trump's rhetoric on January 6th. We are told that that rhetoric inspired the rioting at the Capitol and the invasion of the Capitol building, and, and that was incitement to violence. Okay, so I don't believe that was technical incitement. I think it was raising the temperature to a dangerous level and bad things happen. I feel the same way about Chuck Schumer here. Here's Chuck Schumer. I want to tell you, Gorsuch, I want to tell you, Kavanaugh, you have released the whirlwind and you will pay the price. You won't know what hit you if you go forward with these awful decisions. And I'm sure he meant this politically. I'm also sure that Donald Trump meant politically that there should be peaceful protest at the Capitol building because he literally said there should be peaceful protest at the Capitol building. So just to get this straight, we're about to have a massive telethon today with Democrats claiming that Donald Trump is solely and completely responsible for a bunch of morons running into the Capitol building with violence on their mind in an attempt to hold up the workings of the United States Senate and certifying the election of 2020. But Ch Chuck Schumer says, you won't know what hit you. You're going to reap the whirlwind. Justice Kavanaugh. And then a guy shows up outside Kavanaugh's house to murder him. We're supposed to believe there's no connection whatsoever. And one of these things is totally fine. The other thing is totally horrible. Which is it? If people get blamed for raising the rhetoric and that rhetoric raising, the heat of that rhetoric ends up making life more dangerous. That rule does not only apply to one side. By the way, Chuck Schumer, like a week ago, was saying that he was happy that people were protesting outside the homes of justices. Are you comfortable with the protests that we saw outside the homes of Supreme Court justices over the weekend? If protests are peaceful, yes. My house is, there's protests three, four times a week outside my house. That's the, uh, the American way to peacefully protest is okay. And I've been, that's my wife, sorry. Um, maybe there's a protest outside. <laughs> if it's peaceful, it's totally fine. Well, once again, if the mark of it's okay to say it is say peaceful protest and then everything is fine, then not sure what you're bitching about Trump for, considering that Trump literally said peaceful protest outside the Capitol. Now, I've said before, I think that Donald Trump raised the rhetoric on January 6th. I think that he said a lot of things that were false between November 4th and January 6th that raised the prospect of bad things happening. But the same thing is true here. If you say go protest outside of justice's home, when again, protesting, like 
protesting justices should not be a thing generally, considering they are lifetime appointees who are supposed to be insulated from the political process for purposes of interpreting, not manufacturing the Constitution of the United States, then I'm, I'm not sure how we're not supposed to make the connection. But the answer is we don't make the connection if we're the legacy media, because after all, this is a left winger and these are left wing people. And so we have to pretend that they are all good and wonderful and fine. And protesting justices, not a particularly bright idea, but let me give you a bright idea when it comes to your own wardrobe. Cuts clothing. So here's the thing. All my t-shirts, cuts clothing. Why? Because they are the best. Cuts clothing has spent years perfecting men's t-shirts, taking look good, feel good to a whole new level. Right out of college, Cuts founder and CEO Stephen Borelli got a job in an agency with a casual dress code. In his first week, he was told that his shirt was too athleisure So he searched all over for a presentable and stylish tee. Couldn't find anything that he decided worked for him. Instead, he decided to solve the problem himself. He designed a premium t-shirt that could be worn anywhere on or off the clock. Again, the t-shirt that is my go-to. And when I'm not doing the show, I don't wear button downs all the time, man. I'm wearing t-shirts pretty much all the time. I need Cuts Clothing. I use Cuts Clothing all the time. It's extremely durable. It looks fantastic. It fits just great. The shirts are made to last. Ditch, those fast fashion brands invest in cuts today. They have all the great colors and styles you need. They got crew necks and Henleys and long sleeves. There's something for everyone. Go check them out right now. Refresh your wardrobe in time for summer with Cuts. See for yourself why Cuts is one of the fastest growing men's brands with over 1 million shirts sold. I bought like 100,000 of them. They're that good. Get 15% off your first order by going to cutsclothing.com slash Ben. That's C-U-T-S clothing.com slash Ben. What do you do at Lori Lightfoot's tweet, right? Lori Lightfoot, mayor of Chicago, she tweeted out, when this decision leaked, quote, to my friends in the LGBTQ plus community, the Supreme Court is coming for us next. This moment has to be a call to arms. Is that raising the level of prospective violence in the United States? Again, we're not supposed to we're not supposed to notice any of this. So the New York Times is not noticing it. Dozens and dozens and dozens of stories over this story over at the New York Times. Apparently, this person graduated from Simi Valley High School in 2014. He'd been on the school's cross country team. He'd been a classmate. He had a classmate and friend named Kenny Virginie. And apparently they attended the same college through sophomore year. He said this person was socially awkward, but he never expected him to do anything like this. They're going to increase the security around the other justices' homes without the help of House Democrats, by the way. As the Washington Examiner points out, the safety of Supreme Court justices should be a priority of the U.S. Congress following the arrest of an armed man near Justice Brett Kavanaugh's home on Wednesday. The Senate recognized the need for increased security protocols in early May. Senators John Cornyn of Texas and Chris Coons, Democrat of Delaware, introduced the Supreme Court Police Parity Act of 2022 on May 5th, 2022. It passed with unanimous consent May 9th. The bill extends existing security protocols to immediate families of Supreme Court justices. The House of Representatives took no action on the bill. House Democrats bucked their Senate colleagues and came out against the bill. While the Senate passed a bill this week that would extend protection to Supreme Court justices' family members, we believe that it is critical to safeguard the families of those who choose to serve their country and their communities as judicial clerks and staff, as well, said House Majority Leader Steiny Hoyer in a May 12th press release. Amending the current piece of legislation or introducing a new one altogether should not take a month. The original text is two pages. House Democrats continue to drag their feet. And meanwhile, of course, I'm just going to remind you, the media were fully happy with protests outside Supreme Court justices' homes, they were in favor of the intimidation. They're in favor of the threats. And here is CNN's Laura Jarrett defending protests outside justices' homes. A conversation about civility feels um, like it misses the mark mm. when constitutional rights that you believe that you had for over 50 years are about to be overturned. The justices have security. So far, all of the protests have seemed overwhelmingly nonviolent. Uh, there are plenty of protests that happen every single day in this country, around the country, at abortion clinics, blocking women from getting into clinics. And we don't cover those as if there's if four mm -hmm. alarm fires. And so, yes, they're going to be protests in front of Kavanaugh's house because people are angry. Um, and as long as they stay nonviolent, I think for most uh, for most of the people who are watching it, you can understand w where they're coming from. You can understand where they're coming from to show up outside of somebody's house. No problem at all. Sonny Hostin, of course, the id of the Democratic Party, she said on The View that this is an act of good that people are standing outside justices' homes. Over the weekend, I was I was watching a lot of the protests that were mm -hmm. happening outside of some of the justices' homes. And my understanding is that um, Justice Alito has had to go into hiding mm -hmm. um, uh, because of this, um, you know, a draft opinion that was leaked. And, and while I think it is terrible that um, a justice would have to go into hiding, I think it is really clear to the justices now that, as Anna mentioned, 64 to 66 percent of Americans 
believe that the Supreme Court should uphold Roe v. Wade, right? And so that being said, um, maybe these protests and maybe this outcry gives Chief Justice Roberts some leverage for a more moderate mm -hmm. approach. Uh, because we saw during the hearing that he was looking for a way, a moderate way um, to handle this this, uh, this this case. Yeah, you know, people right outside other people's homes protesting them, attempting to intimidate us. It's a good thing because maybe it'll give us the outcome that we want. It, the funniest thing about this is CNN trying to blame both sides. So just to get this straight, when the entire left wing says as a matter of routine that a Supreme Court decision striking down Roe versus Wade is going to split the country and is going to threaten the lives of millions of women, supposedly. I mean, Joe Biden literally went on Jimmy Kimmel last night and he said, that he didn't think the country was going to stand for the Supreme Court overruling Roe versus Wade, which is hell of a language to use when, you know, a person just got arrested outside of Supreme Court justice's home trying to kill the justice. Like that, that's kind of an amazing thing for Joe Biden to say on Jimmy Kimmel. CNN trying to cover for the fact that this is a left wing person who's repeating left wing talking points, attempting to do the work of the hardcore radical left wing in preventing Roe versus Wade from being overturned. They're like, well, you know, it could be anybody. I mean, who, who knows? I mean, really, aren't both sides to blame? Isn't really it about both sides in the United States? Here is CNN. Supreme Court justices will certainly be, you know, potentially targeted by violent extremists who are angered over this pending ruling that is poised to strike down Roe v. Wade. This is an extremely passionate issue. There are emotions on both sides. Federal officials have made clear over and over they believe the risk truly comes from both sides of this abortion debate. Uh, so certainly this case, uh, you know, really solidifying what federal officials have been warning about. People are angry. They might seek to use the abortion ruling as a justification to cause violence, and that puts these Supreme Court justices, their staff, and other members uh, of this, the judiciary, especially the Supreme Court, at risk. It could be anybody. I mean, who knows? Probably, you know, there could be violence from anyone. Okay, so this is going to be memory hold, the same way that the attempted murder of several Republican Congress people during the congressional baseball shooting based on the rhetoric of Bernie Sanders, that was memory hold too. Just like the murder of actual Dallas police officers by a Black Lives Matter devotee was completely memory hold because he was echoing rhetoric that is widely used by the Democratic Party. That's the way it works in this country. When a person who can even be tenuously linked to the right wing, even if that person overtly disowns the right wing, if that person can be tenuously linked to anything remotely conservative, it becomes a national, con we have to have a national conversation about rhetoric and the use of rhetoric in this and the ideas, the evil conservative ideas that have spawned such acts of horror. But when a person is openly echoing messages promoted by the Democratic Party and the mainstream media. A Democratic Party and mainstream media that went weeks suggesting it was totally fine to stand outside Supreme Court justices' homes protesting, threatening, and intimidating them. Then, what, is that a story? I mean, sh should we really cover it? Is it really that important? Now, bottom line, Joe Biden's just grateful law enforcement was there. That's, that's all that, that matters. Here's Karine Jean-Pierre, the new White House press secretary, saying, you know, in the end, everything worked out okay. Response to the arrest of a man outside near, near Brett Kavanaugh's house. Uh, as we've been standing here, we've seen that uh, he's been charged with arrest, attempted murder as well. So uh, the president condemns the actions of this individual uh, in the strong terms and is grateful to law enforcement for quickly taking him into custody. As the president has co consistently made clear, public officials, including judges, must be able to do their jobs without concern for their personal safety. Oh, is that, is that what he's made clear, you know, via his last press secretary, who, as we just saw one second ago, was saying that it's totally fine to protest outside justice's homes. After all, they're protesters outside abortion clinics. It's a good thing that Joe Biden is grateful to law enforcement for protecting Brett Kavanaugh. Meanwhile, Joe Biden is headed on over to Jimmy Kimmel. Well, if, if all of that puts you in mind of wanting to go to sleep, well, I have some good news for you. Helix Sleep can help make that happen for you. Helix Sleep has a quiz. It takes just two minutes to complete, matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. Why would you buy a mattress made for someone else? With Helix, you're getting a mattress you know will be perfect for the way you sleep. Everybody's unique. Helix knows that. They have several different mattress models to choose from. They have soft, medium, and firm mattresses. Mattresses great for cooling you down if you sleep hot. Mattresses great for spinal alignment to prevent morning aches and pains. Even a Helix Plus mattress for plus size sleepers. I took the Helix quiz. I was matched with a model that is firm and breathable because that is what I need. I tend to heat up at night, so I need a, a mattress that keeps me cool. Also, my back aches if the bed is too soft. Helix knows that, so they sent me a mattress made just for me. If you're looking for a mattress that is made just for you, personalized to you, take the quiz, order the mattress you're matched to. The mattress comes directly to your door, shipped for free. They've got a 10-year warranty. can try it out for 100 nights risk-free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it, but you absolutely will. Helix has financing options, flexible payment plans. A great night's sleep is never far away. Helix is so good that I didn't just get this mattress for myself and my wife. 
Got it from my parents. Got it from my sisters. Helix is offering up to 350 bucks off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners right now, which is a fantastic deal. This is their best offer yet. Hurry on over to helixsleep.com slash Ben to get started. And speaking of the president of the United States, he was deployed to Jimmy Kimmel last night. That's because the only person you will sit with if you're Joe Biden is the late night host who is going to provide you NC-17 rated favors. You need Jimmy Kimmel strutting on there, in there, telling you that he's your private dancer, your dancer for money. He'll do what you want him to do. That's the only way that Joe Biden sits with him. There's a reason for that. His approval rating is currently at historic lows. He has the, he's reached new lows, according to Morning Consult. The latest survey finds 58% of voters disapprove of Biden's job performance, 39% approve. It marks the 46th president's lowest approval rating and highest disapproval rating in 62 weekly surveys since he took office in January 2021. For comparison, Biden's latest numbers are worse than Donald Trump's were at this time four years ago, when 45% approved and 52% disapproved. Joe Biden is at 39, but is he not, he's not just worse. He's six point worse than Donald Trump, the worst president in American history, was at this time in his presidency. Biden's popularity or lack thereof mirrors Trump's standing in June 2020, which was the middle of the COVID pandemic and the BLM riots. Apparently, 37% of Democrats strongly approve of Joe Biden's handling of the job. That is a horrible number. <laughs> okay, they're saying that, that you know, there's a the Republicans strongly disapprove of Joe Biden's job handling by an 80% to 20% margin. 37% of Democrats strongly approve of it. 30, like that's a horrible number. That is a horrible number. Okay, so that means that Joe Biden has to somehow try to rescue his presidency. He's not gonna do it by talking to, you know, actual reporters, even the ones who are likely to provide him with light massage services, shall we say. Or, you know, the people at the New York Times and the Washington Post, Reuters, the AP. According to Alex Thompson, White House reporter and co-author of Politico's West Wing playbook, Biden has not done an interview with any of these outlets. The New York Times' Peter Baker said, I can't think of a parallel situation. It's the fifth president I've covered. This is the first one I haven't interviewed. They feel neither the obligation nor the opportunity. Baker added, the best White House reporting often isn't the result of interviews with the president, but that extended sit-downs remain an important function of accountability. He said, reporters whining about not getting interviews is one of the least attractive elements of the White House press corps. But the president talks about defending democracy, and that's part of democracy too, answering questions from people not on your side. I mean, he won't even answer questions from people who are pretty much on his side, like Peter Baker of the New York Times. Instead, he sits down with Jimmy Kimmel, who, again, is there to provide the full spectrum of sexually pleasurable services to the president of the United States. I mean, how in the pocket of the Biden White House is Jimmy Kimmel? He literally uses the word we to describe the agenda of Joe Biden, as in he and Joe Biden have the same agenda. This is Jimmy Kimmel last night on ABC. I think a lot of Democrats are frustrated because, you know, we got out and voted. Um, we won the House, the Senate, um, the White House, obviously. And still, we have had made very little progress as far as I'm concerned when it comes to guns, obviously, uh, reproductive rights, voting rights, climate change, the, all these things. And in some ways, we've, we've moved backward. We. A lot of we there. A lot of we there from Jimmy Kimmel. That's why Joe Biden is there. I mean, he's got Jimmy Kimmel here providing massage on his second chakra, and the man still can't get it together. It's absolutely unbelievable. It it, 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 it's crazy. And Jimmy Kimmel is there to provide him with all the services his heart could desire, and he's still having a, a biological response problem. Okay, so Joe Biden shows up. He's trying to rescue his presidency. And pretty much all he has is a bunch of incredibly divisive talking points and his face begins to babble. That's, that's pretty much what he has. He has a face hole that spews nothing except for some warmed over slogans. It's, what, he, what he says is not just like warmed over rhetoric. It's like take the turkey out from Thanksgiving two years ago and try to defrost it rhetoric. It's not rewarmed. It's defrosted from the age of, the, the age of Dwight Eisenhower, his rhetoric. Okay, so, so here is Joe Biden calling Fox News the Death Star. Okay, can I just point out here, Joe Biden won 81 million votes, minimum, right? He won, how many votes did Joe Biden, what was the final vote count? Final vote count in 2020 was that Joe Biden won approximately 81, uh, 81 million votes. Okay, the, the total Fox News viewership, like on their best shows, is maybe 4 million. Like they blow it out 4 million. But apparently Fox News is a threat to the republic. He actually calls Fox News the Death Star. So you have the president of the United States, the most powerful person on earth, a man who's been running for this office, Joe Biden, since he was in diapers. 
And here he is explaining that Fox News is the threat to the republic. Maybe it's just that Americans aren't as knowledgeable as they should be. Or maybe there's a, uh, a, a Death Star pumping false information into our brains. Fox, brain. right? Or, yeah, or maybe... <laughs> My, my favorite part of this is where the audience is is brought in to laugh, like in a bad 1990s sitcom. There are no laugh lines in this 24-minute interview, but the audience laughs anyway. And you're supposed to laugh because even though no one's saying anything funny, there's sort of timing where it could theoretically be funny, but it's not. But the audience laughs, and so you're supposed to laugh along. So Joe Biden is like, well, you know, it's, it's, it's that Fox News Death Star. As, as Jimmy Kimmel goes to the, uh, goes to the massage parlor. It's like this. This is what Joe Biden's got. No wonder he's at 39 percent approval rating. Then Joe Biden joked about sending his political opponents to jail, which is always a charming feature of this presidency. Remember that time when we were told that Donald Trump was a threat to the free press? Donald Trump was a when he talks about that. He said enemy of the people about the press. This means the press are under deep and abiding threat. Jim Acosta is going to record books written by Jim Acosta in Jim Acosta's own voice while staring in a mirror, looking at Jim Acosta, talking about how oppressed he is in an air conditioned studio in Washington, D.C., because the press were so under the boot of Donald Trump for saying mean things about the press. So Joe Biden says Fox News is the Death Star, and also his Republican political opponents should metaphorically be put in jail. If we do the same thing they do, our democracy will literally be in jeopardy. Well, I mean, yeah. I'm not a joke. And I, I understand their argument, but also it's like you're playing Monopoly with somebody who, you know, won't pass go and won't follow any of the rules. And how do you ever make any progress if they're not following the rules? Well, you got to send them to jail, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's all a metaphor. <laughs> Jimmy Kimmel. <laughs> it's, it, it's absurd. Just, just, again, another note. Yesterday, Matthew McConaughey was at the White House talking gun control. The president of the United States was chuckling it up with chuckles over here on late night TV. And it was just all laughs. It was a barrel of laughs between Joe Biden and Jimmy Kimmel. Joe Biden suggested that the only time that he would ever call President Trump is to flush sensitive documents. I mean, it does make sense that Joe Biden does need somebody else to help him flush the toilet. That's the only part of this that actually makes any sense. Just a, just a process question. When you have sensitive documents that you need to flush down the toilet, do you do that? Is, he, is that done in your office toilet or is that done in the bathroom, in the personal bathroom area? Oh, I call Trump. Uh, <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> Joker grin. Rictus grin from, from Joe Biden. Again, the man does need help every time he goes to the bathroom. So that, that is not a particular surprise. And herein lies the biggest problem for Joe Biden. I mean, the biggest pro one of the biggest problems, obviously, is that he's got an echo chamber of a media who keep encouraging him to double down on progressive stupidity that the American people are not interested in. That is actually a huge problem for him. The other big problem is that the man's got applesauce for brains. The hamster wheel is moving, but the hamster's dead. That elevator don't go to the top floor. Here's is, here is Joe Biden trying to explain that the biggest problem he has is that he is unable to fully communicate his ideas in the best possible way. And we need to do a better job of communicating in the Shambadu. Here we go. No so, question. So there's about a it. lot of major things we've done. But what we haven't done is we haven't been able to communicate it in a way that is. Uh, um, let me say another way. Well, see, that's kind of perfect. Yeah, well, we haven't been able to communicate but it. But look how the press has changed. Mm hmm. Look how the press is changed. It has changed. Oh, listen, it's, it's, I, I get it. I know you get you overstand it. Yeah. You don't just you understand it. You overstand it. You understand it. it. <laughs> but here's the deal. Here's One the deal, of the Jack. things is that it's very difficult now to have a... He's lost. He's gone. Um, yep. Even, that look in the eyes. With, with notable exceptions, even the really good reporters, they have to get the number of clicks on, on, the, on nightly news. Mm -hmm. and you can't get so a click on... Instead of asking a question... Anyway, it just anyway, everything gets, it's just, Jack, gets sensationalized. Pony boy. In ways that, but I'm convinced we can get through this. We have to get through it. And one of the things, look. I'm going to take a break, and then we'll talk a little oh bit Oh, my God. And up. Jimmy Kimmel comes in like that night nurse and starts wiping Joe Biden's ass. He's like, I, I, you know, I, I know this is awkward, sir. You're the president of the United States, but we definitely need to go to this Kibble commercial over here. Like, they, I, I'm sorry, I can't let you struggle like this. That is a masterpiece. That clip is just, that clip is everything. That is a man who could not spill urine out of a boot if the instructions were written on the, on the sole of the boot. Like if they're written on the bottom of the boot, there's no way that man could pour urine out of the boot, that, that president of the United States. 
that is that is wild. I, I got to play it again. I'm sorry. I have to play it again. We need to break this down because I want an actual chart of where he goes. You can see him in real time. And again, the, 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 the light may be on in the attic, but there is nothing but a cold corpse up there. It is wild. He starts off by, again, I, I never, I rarely play a clip twice on the show, but I have to here because it just demonstrates that this person is not there. He is not there. And I know Democrats have to be panicking watching this. He's on late night TV with a person who is dedicated solely to providing him Lewinsky-like pleasures. And he still cannot make it happen. He just can't. GetRoman.com, man. This is, it's just, it's insane. Here, here is Joe Biden. We're gonna, I'm, there are gonna be some stops and starts here, guys, because I need to try and follow what, what this man is saying. We're gonna go down a wander among the heather in, in Scotland here with Joe Biden. No so, question. So there's about a it. lot of major things we've done. But what we haven't done is we haven't been able to communicate it in a way that is, uh, um, let me say it another way. Hey, well, stop. See, that's- okay. We haven't been able to communicate in a way that is, you know, words. I, I, in, let's say, I, I, in, um, easy. Yeah, continue. Kind of perfect. Yeah, well, we haven't been able to communicate. But it look how the press. Even Jimmy Kimmel's like, "This is bad." Mm-hmm. Look how the press is. It has changed. Oh, listen, it's, I, it's, I get it. I know you get. You overstand it. Yeah. You don't just understand it. You overstand you, you it. Understand. Stop <laughs> it. Okay, that that is him trying to save himself. He says, "You don't just you, you overstand it." And then he's like, "Oh wait, overstand isn't a word." And that that wheel is spinning. You can see the steam starting to come off the wheel. It's starting to smoke and spark up there. The, the steam is starting to come out his ears. The eyeballs are starting to. Like he's on the fritz, he's getting the cookie monster googly eyes here. And you can see he's, in a second, he's going to go to the full thousand yard stare where he doesn't know what he's talking about. The same look that my baby gets on her face when she's trying to poop in her diaper. He gets that look where he's just staring at nothing, but he's talking on national TV. Yeah, here we go. But here's the deal, Jack. One of the things is that it's very difficult now to have a... Um, even oh with, with notable exceptions, even the really good reporters, they have to get the number of clicks on, on, the, on the nightly news. Stop. Mm-hmm. You can't get a click on the nightly news. It doesn't work that way. What it, the, the thing about reporters is when they're using their phonograph and their rotary telephone, they got to get clicks on there, on there, on there, on there, on there, on there, on there. And then the actual records start skipping. This man, you, you chose this, people. This is what you wanted. You bought the ticket, you take the ride. This is the man you chose to be president. There are 330 million humans in the United States. And this is the one. You were like, he deserves 81 million votes. Let's do that guy. This is going to work out fantastically. But let us finish this, this trip down horror road here. So instead of asking a question, anyway, it just everything anyway. gets gets sensationalized in ways that, but I'm convinced we can get through this. We have to get through it. And one of the things, look. I'm going to take a break and then we'll talk a little bit more. I don't, if you don't blame mind. I don't blame you. Yeah, no one blames you. No one blames you for, for taking a break because my goodness, we got to wheel you off to make sure that you are still cognitively capable of performing basic human functions. That is a man who at this point has to be fed he has to be fed by another human being, like strained peas or something. My goodness, he's gone. My goodness. And that is the warmest possible political environment. No wonder he's probably the way to pull him out of the tailspin is to put him on more TV. You wonder why he hasn't done a serious interview in months and months and months? This would be the reason when you underperform on Jimmy Kimmel. That is not even a, that is not even possible for a Democratic president. It is not possible. And yet Joe Biden never say impossible. In the words of Kevin Garnett of the Boston Celtics, anything is possible. You can underperform on Jimmy Kimmel if you are if you are Joe Biden. Well, Joe Biden may no longer be with us, but here's the thing. If you are seeking to protect your financial future, you have to be with it. And that is why you need to take a look at American financing. Peak home buying season is still in full swing. Many home buyers are wondering where exactly is the housing market headed? Well, believe it or not, now's a pretty good time to buy, especially when you work with American financing, America's home for home loans. Here's why. They can actually help you lock into a competitive rate right now, while allowing you 120 days to shop for your new home, which is really good. If you think the prices are going to go down over the next few months, and you also want to lock in today's rates because the rates are likely going up, you lock in today's rates. 
prices go down, and now you are in the black. This way, you don't have to worry about rates rising. You can expect to get a custom loan and fast closing. Plus, you never have to pay upfront or hidden fees. I'm telling you, it's worth at least a 10-minute phone call to learn more, especially because home values are still looking really good right now. Many markets are up 20% or more. That means your investment could pay off quickly, setting you up for a healthy future. Learn more today with a free loan consultation at 866-721-3300. That is 866-721-3300 or visit AmericanFinancing.net. NMLS 182-334, NMLSConsumerAccess.org. Go check them out today, 866 866- 721-3300. That is 866-721-3300 to get started at American Financing. All righty, folks, you made What is a Woman? A massive success. We're talking about the top documentary in America. It is the most streamed documentary in America right now. It also has zero reviews from the reviewers because they're just going to pretend it doesn't exist. But you know that it exists because over 2,500 of you have rated it over at Rotten Tomatoes. It's got an audience score of 97%. Everybody is talking about this film because it's completely changing the conversation about transgender ideology and radical sexual orientation nonsense from the left. This is a conversation changer. It's a conversation starter. It's a vital, vital film. Most of the people who say they hate the film have never seen one moment of it because obviously they can't actually answer Matt's question, what is a woman? They could stop all of this by answering the question. They're not doing so. That shows you something. Here's the thing. All of this is possible because of you. Our members make this possible. A lot of other corporations, they have hundreds of millions of dollars in public financing at their disposal because they're publicly traded companies, or they've got angel investors who come in with hundreds of millions of dollars. Not us. We operate from your membership, which is why we need your membership. Head on over to whatisawoman.com, become a member, watch the film today. It's totally worth it. And I've gotten so many comments from hundreds, probably thousands of people at this point talking about this film. It's a quality piece of content. And guess what? We have so much more coming for you this month. When you subscribe, you're going to get so much great stuff. I'm talking about Gina Carano's film, and we've got a documentary that's coming out from Candace Owens. We have some huge announcements later this month. This is all just the beginning over at Daily Wire. Please join us. Whatisawoman.com. Become a member today. Watch the film. You're listening to the largest, fastest growing conservative podcast and radio show in the nation. So here is the thing. When Jimmy Kimmel is incapable of making Joe Biden look good, which it, that's an amazing thing. Jimmy Kimmel can't even pretend to make Joe Biden look good here. That's a problem. A bigger problem is that Joe Biden is so wildly disconnected from the American people that he just keeps saying things that no one believes. So for example, California just saw a right-wing surge. And by right-wing, I mean people who still have a functioning prefrontal cortex. They kicked out Chase Bowden, who is the DA in San Francisco. He no longer has that job because he decided that his job actually meant, what if we leave heroin needles for the children in the parks make sure that there is poop on every street corner and allow our CVSs to be ransacked by criminals. And so even in San Francisco, like this is a little much. And in LA, it appears they might actually elect a closeted Republican mayor of the city because it turns out that Americans don't like the crime program of the Democrats. So Joe Biden's response to this is, well, you know, both parties are responsible for the crime wave in the United States. Oh, are they? That one's got, that dog's gonna hunt probably. Here is Joe Biden on the tarmac at what appears to be Burbank Airport. I think the voters sent a clear message last night. Both parties have to step up and do something about crime as well as gun violence. That's your takeaway? As you recall, with the first major bill we passed, we gave the states and localities billions of dollars. Billions of dollars to have and encourage them to use it to hire police officers and reform the police department. So his take is both parties are getting chastised on crime? That, that's his take. That's his take. Because here's the thing. Literally yesterday, Joe Biden has a sentencing commission nominee. Okay, her name is Laura Mate, And um, she was asked about mandatory minimums. This was yesterday, the same day he's saying both parties need to worry. Both parties need to rambadoo about worrying in the, in the Jan Simbody and in the crime. Meanwhile, his nominee for the Federal Sentencing Commission is being asked about mandatory minimums. And she's like, well, I'm not big on any sort of mandatory. Uh, Do I have to answer these questions? Is there any crime for which you think a mandatory minimum is appropriate? Thank you, Senator. My understanding is this body decides whether there are mandatory minimums. And as a commissioner, my job would be- You make recommendations. I'm asking you if you think that there's any crime, rape, I mean, for which there ought to be a mandatory minimum, because you said earlier there shouldn't be. I'm astounded by that. Thank you, Senator. 
If I'm confirmed, I'd like to make an informed recommendation on that after consulting. How am I going to make an informed judgment on voting for you if you won't tell me what your positions are? (laughs) I don't know if you changed them or not. It sounds like you have changed them. You signed a letter. You you took very frankly radical policy positions, and now you won't answer me. What am I to draw from that? Senator, I I hope that what you draw is that I'm open to listening to this diverse. No, I I think what I draw from it is is that you don't want to answer my question. (laughs) Yes. So that's Senator Josh Hawley questioning a current Biden nominee who refuses to say whether she backs any mandatory minimum sentences for criminality at all, at all. And meanwhile, Joe Biden's like, well, both parties are getting punished for the for the crime. Really? Are they, Joe? Because there's another thing I noticed, which is that Democrat DAs all over the country in major American cities are getting just slammed by everyone in law enforcement because they're doing a terrible job. So, for example, George Gascon is another one of these George Soros supported prosecutors. I'm allowed to say the name George Soros, by the way, because I'm an Orthodox Jew, because I've been informed by the media that if you say George Soros' name, this automatically means you're an anti-Semite. No, George Soros donates literally tens of millions of dollars in a wide variety of countries to push progressivism, hardcore radical progressivism that's particularly true for prosecutors in the United States. That is just a simple funding fact. In any case, George Gaskin is the DA in L.A., and he refuses to prosecute any crime. He happens to be a Democrat. No shock there. Uh, Here was the Los Angeles County Association of Deputy DA's VP Eric Seidel saying, yeah, this guy's a criminal's best friend. If you're a violent criminal in Los Angeles right now, your biggest ally is not your defense lawyer. It's not the judge. It's not the jury. It's George Gascon. That's who your biggest supporter is. And that's the reason why criminal defendants all throughout Los Angeles County want George Gascon to give them a deal because they know that he is their biggest cheerleader. I wonder why the Democrats are having such trouble. By the way, it's at every local issue. Okay, all the local issues, Democrats are getting skunked because all the local issues have been nationalized. You have a Democratic Party that insists from the White House that if we do not mandate that small children be indoctrinated in the idea that they could be a member of the opposite sex or that they should consider their own bisexuality or pansexuality or whatever the stupid sexual buzzword of the day is from the left, that this is a form of child abuse. Meanwhile, the American people are just rebelling against this. Article from the Washington Post today. Across the country, educational equity was in vogue. Then it wasn't. By educational equity, they mean left-wing nonsense at the local school board level. And now it turns out parents don't like that crap. According to the Washington Post, a racial equity program that began with widespread support and was propelled by George Floyd's murder all but died on a chilly Wednesday evening in a near-empty school board meeting room. During a budget debate, a pair of liberal board members were no match for the newly elected majority. The conservatives had taken office after a campaign focused on race and allegations that critical race theory had invaded the local schools, the most diverse in El Paso County. Their victory last November had already resulted resulted in the superintendent's departure. Now the equity program he championed was on its way out too. If Floyd's murder forced many schools to consider systemic racism holding back students of color, the 2021 elections delivered a backlash. Across the country last year, school board elections became the epicenter of a culture war over race. Conservative victories led many boards to fire superintendents and curtail racial justice initiatives. Maybe that's because you guys pursued a radical educational agenda at odds with what parents actually want from the schools to which they delegate the education of their children. Maybe that's the problem. But Joe Biden has nothing to say about any of this. Because again, he's got that bubble. He has that bubble. Well, here's the thing. The bubble ain't going to save him. It's particularly not going to save him because the economy is in serious, serious trouble. According to the Wall Street Journal, stagflation is generally viewed as a relic of the 1970s. Economists are now warning it could make a comeback. The term stagflation is broadly defined as sluggish growth tied with rising inflation. Economists haven't given it much thought since the 1970s when U.S. consumers lined up to fill their cars with high-priced gasoline and the jobless rate hit 9%. Earlier this week, the World Bank sharply lowered its growth forecast for the global economy this year and warned of several years of high inflation and tepid growth, reminiscent of the stagflation of the 70s. Stagflation spells trouble for the economy. Rising inflation erodes consumer purchasing power. Weaker demand hurts companies' profits and causes layoffs. Stagflation puts the Federal Reserve in a bind because the central bank's job is to keep both inflation and unemployment low. The Fed can raise interest rates to curb inflation, but if it moves too aggressively, it risks strangling spending and tipping the economy into a recession. So this is a serious problem for Joe Biden. We are now in what appears to be an increasingly stagflationary economy. And this administration's answer to that is, well, Joe Biden's done all he can do. Maybe we'll raise some taxes or something, but he's done all he can do. So here's Janet Yellen, straight from the Shire, explaining to you that Joe Biden has done everything he can do on gas prices. So what we learned from the Biden administration over the past several days is, one, that the president of the United States is no longer functional. He won't do interviews with anybody with serious questions, but he will go on Jimmy Kimmel. And even there, 
his brain will just start shooting off sparks. We learned from the Biden administration that they have no opinions that are in consonance with the broader American public on anything from the economy to Ukraine to energy policy. They got nothing. But also, all of their political opponents are super bad. And so we need Matthew McConaughey to speak about gun control at the White House. Does this sound like a successful administration to you? Or was electing this man a very, very bad mistake? And him bringing in his coterie of morons to run the place, an even worse mistake. Here is Janet Yellen, who, remember, five minutes ago was saying that inflation was transitory, now saying, you know, when it comes to gas prices, it ain't much the president of the United States can do. With respect to energy, the uh, administration has done everything that they can to bring down energy costs, for example, through um, an historic release um, of a million barrels a day from the strategic petroleum reserve and um, energy prices, gas prices, while very high, have risen a lot. They would be higher without that. Oh, well, yeah, but probably was the strategic petroleum. I mean, they're at $5 a gallon. We're doing $5 a gallon gas, lady. I'm saying about small releases from the strategic petroleum reserve, which used to be for military purposes, right? We were at war and there was a gas shortage because of that. Not the price was up and Joe Biden needed to relieve political pressure on himself. And it completely failed. By the way, you know what her strategy is for bringing down inflation? She wants to reconfigure tariffs on imports from China. So what if we get easy on trade from China? So just to point out the obvious here, China is a global enemy of the United States. China is not just stealing our intellectual property and imprisoning a million Uyghur Muslims and keeping a billion people in the bondage of communist tyranny and spreading its military outposts around the South China Sea and making deals with the Solomon Islands to try and box in Australia. China has cheated on every trade deal we've ever done with them. And her plan is, what if we start, you know, we, we have to relieve this inflation. I mean, this is not really a shock, considering that this is the same administration that has tried to relieve sanctions on Nicolas Maduro, the dictator of Venezuela, the commie dictator of Venezuela, in a failed attempt to bring down oil prices. Now, Jenny Yellen's like, what if we relieve tariffs on China? Now, there's always a case to look at tariffs and decide whether they are effective on behalf of the United States consumer, on behalf of the U.S. voter, or whether they serve a national security purpose. But- I'm just going to point out here that the same people who are saying that we need a global minimum tax, this is what the Biden administration is arguing, is that every corporate tax across the world should be 15% or higher so as to justify continued investment in the U.S. economy. In, in other words, we have to basically cudgel other countries into raising their own tax rates so that our businesses don't run overseas and then organize and say Ireland. While we are busily increasing regulations and taxes, we are going to lower the restrictions on trade with China. Geniuses over here. According to the Wall Street Journal, Yellen, speaking at a House Ways and Means Committee hearing on Wednesday, said she expected the administration to have additional information on its plans in the coming weeks. I think some reductions may be warranted, she said, adding it could help bring down prices. Also at the hearing, she defended the international tax deal she negotiated with her counterparts around the world, saying she was confident that Poland, a key holdout, would come aboard. By the way, we might be able to cudgel enough countries into joining this global tax regime that sucks money out of the global economy on behalf of governments everywhere. And it might allow us to essentially, through a collusive process, remain uncompetitive on our tax basis. Sooner or later, there will be a country that just decides, you know what, I'm not doing this. And they set their corporate tax rate at 5%, and suddenly everybody organizes over there. If any country had any brains at all, they would be thinking about doing that right now. This is These are the experts. These are the experts. But pay no attention to the fact that they're incompetent on pretty much every front. Instead, pay attention to gun control. After all, if we can emotionally manipulate you on the issue of gun control and make you believe that if you oppose the Democrats' agenda on gun control, because it makes no sense, that you are in favor of the murder of small children, then maybe we'll win some votes. So on that basis, the House passed wide-ranging gun control legislation. It is certain to fail in the Senate. This, by the way, again, just to point out the obvious, this was the top headline at the New York Times. Story number 39 was the attempted murder of a Supreme Court justice. The top story was House passes gun control legislation, and then in parentheses, which will immediately die in the Senate. A divided House on Wednesday approved a wide-ranging package of gun control legislation in a party-line vote. The measures were all but certain to go nowhere in the evenly divided Senate, where negotiations continued on more modest proposals that could draw bipartisan support necessary to move forward. They tried to ban high-capacity magazines. They also attempted to formally ban bump stocks, which effectively had been banned by executive order for a while now. Also, they were passing a provision to raise the age of purchase of a semi-automatic rifle to 21. Nine Republicans voted in favor of that provision. A couple of Democrats opposed the provision. Again, it doesn't make any sort of intellectual sense, that provision, unless you're also willing to raise the age of voting 
and dr being drafted by the United States military to 21. Either you're an adult at 21 or you're an adult at 18. You don't get to be half an adult and half not an adult. So, again, it, it's, it's pretty amazing. What the House Democrats also tried to do is tack on a measure condemning white supremacy to the gun control measure so they could then claim that Republicans had voted in favor of white supremacy, which is just the cheapest and stupidest political trick in the book. Democrats put forward these omnibus packages that contain a thousand provisions. You hate 999 of them. One of them is fine. And you vote against the bill. And then they're like, ah, it's because you oppose this one provision. This is their dumb plan to, to win votes. It's the, the Democrats on gun control. They, they may think that they have the wind with them. They do not. Because as always, this, these Second Amendment issues always break down the same way. Democrats claim that they have reasonable measures to propose. They then propose a bunch of unreasonable measures. The American people look at them. They're not so hot on the measures. And then everything sort of goes back to status quo ante. That's just the way this works. Meanwhile, actual solutions to the problems like, you know, more armed security at schools, hardening of the, hardening of the actual barriers around schools, making sure there are protocols with regard to making sure doors close automatically, all this kind of stuff. And social measures like building up of families, making sure that there are solid communities that are able to spot incipient bad seeds and then report them, getting rid of all of the bad mental health laws that prevent the involuntary commitment of, of violent people. And all those things go completely by the wayside because it's all for rhetorical flourish, apparently. And this is what Democrats are into. They're not into answers. The most obvious example of this was yesterday. So Katie Porter, who's beloved of the progressive left, mainly because she, she is an MSNBC host in the guise of a congressional seat holder. She, uh, she was doing a tete-a-tete a -tete with Amy Swearer from the Heritage Foundation, who is an advocate on behalf of the Second Amendment. And her entire shtick was, you're a liar, I'm going to call you a perjurer, and then I won't let you ask any questions. This is the Democratic Party on the Second Amendment. They may think this, play, this may play on Twitter. It does not play in Peoria. You knew that the bill would allow any gun owner to maintain possession of any semi-automatic assault weapon that was lawfully possessed before the bill became law. No, uh, so that is the case under that bill. The problem is Reclaiming anytime time, that is transferred to anybody Reclaiming else. my time. I asked you if that bill was correct, if the bill would allow any gun owner to maintain possession, and you said yes, yet you testified that the bill would allow people to become felons overnight. Earlier today, you testified that you hoped that this was the last time you testify before Congress. For the sake of our nation and the integrity of this Congress, I, said I do Congress, too. After a mass shooting, trying to figure out how to solve a problem that we are all heavily invested in solving. Ms. Swear, that is I have not. Your point of okay, and then she, it's amazing. Swear says to her, can I answer the question? And Porter says, no. She says, this is my time, Porter says. This was played as victory by the left. Because apparently the left's entire agenda, in the end, the left's entire agenda when it comes to pretty much any issue is pretend the other side doesn't exist. When it comes to the transgender issue, we'll pretend the other side doesn't exist, which is why they won't even review what is a woman. It's why they pretend that there is a wide spectrum of support for the idea that a boy can be a girl and a girl can be a boy. They just pretend the other side doesn't exist. It's why when it comes to gun control, they don't want to hear any sort of actual debate over the issues. They just want to pretend that the other side doesn't exist. And you're utterly unreasonable. And here's Matthew McConaughey straight from the set of how to date a guy in, or lose a guy in 10 days to explain to you how all of this, how all of this worked. Again, ignoring the other side is not the way that you're going to win elections, but Democrats apparently are under this wild misimpression, which is why they're still trotting out people like AOC to claim that the real problem here is gun manufacturers who are seeking blood money. In 2020, 22.8 million guns were sold, reflecting a 64% increase from 2019, correct? Correct. In one year. And across the board, gun manufacturers and ammunition companies began to see record profits. Is that right? That's correct. Now let's put into, that into context. In 2020, again, more than 45,000 Americans died by gunfire, reflecting an almost three-fold increase from 2015. Are those statistics correct? That's accurate. So in your view, are you seeing a correlation between gun profits and gun deaths in the United States? Yes. This is about blood money. It's about blood. Okay, can, can we just point out here how stupid what she is saying is? So the number of guns in circulation in the United States rose dramatically between 1994 and 2013. And so did the, and the murder rate at the same exact time declined dramatically in the United States. And then all of a sudden, Democrats started saying to cops that they shouldn't police places. And this resulted in two things. One, a bunch of people going out and buying guns because they said, if the cops can't protect us, I will protect myself. And two, more people dying because the cops weren't there to protect them. But apparently correlation equals causation for the 
empty headed congresswoman from Brooklyn, New York. She is she is just so off. But again, it's not about actually having a valuable discussion on these issues. It's about blood money. I have a question. Did the gun manufacturers not want to sell their weapons in 2007 or 2010 or 2012? Why did she think that there was a massive increase? It's amazing. Like she, She's refuting herself in those stats. Why did she think there was a massive increase in the number of guns bought in 2020? Any ideas? What could have happened in 2020 that made a lot of people want to go get guns? Could it have been an entire mass movement calling the police in the United States systemically racist and calling to defund the police and massive increases in crime that came directly from that? Huge riots in major American cities. I bought extra guns during that time. Did you? I'll bet a lot of people did. But according to her, it's because the gun, the gun manufacturers suddenly got greedy. This is always their excuse. They provide crappy economic policy. The economics of the United States turn the wrong way. They're like, ah, corporations are greedy. But I thought it was your argument. The corporations are always greedy. So that factor didn't change. But again, n- none of this is about anything remotely resembling a debate. It's just about stupid political gamesmanship. And if you're talking stupid political gamesmanship, we have to go to the stupidest person on the block. That would be Joy Behar. Again, it's a running battle on The View as to who is the dumbest person on The View. At a certain point, somebody will actually reach a zero IQ and yet still be functioning, and we will have new medical discoveries in the field. But that 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 race to the bottom is ongoing. Here is Joy Behar making her case to be the dumbest person on that show. Let me give you a story. There's a man in Connecticut that watched his neighbor have a home invasion and watched his whole, their whole family get killed. He built his own AR-15 because Connecticut won't let you buy them, but you can abide by rules that allow you to build them. And then he has one in his house to protect his family because he never wants to see that happen again. He is a black man. It's odd. Most AR-15 owners are former military, okay. 35 plus let me and say married. One more thing. So that's all I'm saying okay. is that they're yeah. not once, crazy once, people. Okay. Here's the thing. Once black people get guns in this country, the gun laws will change. Trust me. Once pe- She's saying this to a person of color. One's, is she unaware that something like one in four black people in this country have a gun? Like lots of black people own guns. And the, the, the suggestion, of course, is that everybody who's pro-Second Amendment is anti-black people having guns. Nope. Pretty good with black people having guns and white people having guns. So long as everybody's law-abiding, get a gun. Uh, y- your racism is showing again, Joy. I mean, the, the amount of sort of, ins- uh, the amount of just Inherent racism on that show is insane. Between Whoopi Goldberg declaring everything in America is racist, everything in world history is racist, except for Adolf Hitler, a thing Whoopi Goldberg actually said, and Joy Behar declaring that black people, if allowed to own guns, would provide such a menace to the public that there would be changes in gun laws. How much tacit racism just goes without saying on the view? It's it's crazy. And bottom line is this. Democrats have a world of hurt coming for them. They have a world of hurt. And no matter the emotional manipulation, no matter the Jimmy Kimmel appearances or the Second Amendment talk and the the gun control talk, no no matter how much the Democrats try to claim that we have to teach radical gender theory to your children in order to protect protect the children. This is the case they make, which, by the way, is the most Orwellian double think garbage I've ever heard to protect your kids. We need to make sure that they believe that they can be a member of the opposite sex. It's to protect the children. You guys want to play this game? You're going to pay the price and you should pay the price. You should pay. And, And a compliant media that protects your rear at every available opportunity, is not providing you a service. They're actually just making you weak. They're making you weak. They're destroying your immune system. The immune system of politics is the feedback loop. When there is no feedback loop, there is no immune system. And this is what the Democratic Party is suffering. They now have a fatal case of the American people not liking their ideas. All right, we'll be back here later today. We'll talk about the January 6th extravaganza, the Lollapalooza of January 6th, which is supposed to happen today. In the meantime, go check out the Michael Moll Show. That's available right now. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Bradford Carrington. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Supervising producer, Mathis Glover. Production manager, Pavel Wydowski. Associate producer, Savannah Dominguez-Morris. Editor, Adam Saievitz. Audio mixer, Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup artist and wardrobe, Fabiola Cristina. Production coordinator, Jessica Kranz. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2022. A leftist assassin tries to murder Brett Kavanaugh in his home. San Francisco's pro-crime district attorney gets recalled. And a former Democrat congressman admits to stuffing ballot boxes in Pennsylvania to help his clients win. Check it out on The Michael Knowles Show. Hey, 